mind has three kinds of food. Sensory contact, sensory consciousness, and what are called the intentions of the intellect. In other words, the thoughts that you churn out. As we sit here meditating, there's not much new in terms of sensory contact or sensory consciousness. So the mind's going to churn out a lot of thoughts until you give it something better to feed on. This is why directed thought and evaluation are part of the first part of right concentration. You have to learn how to direct your mind to a, a topic that it finds interesting. And then you evaluate it in such a way that you feel you can settle down with it and feel a sense of ease and well-being. The image the Buddha gives is of a bathman who's mixing a ball of kind of like a dough that they would use instead of soap back in those days. You start with a powder and then you mix it with water. And you knead the water through the powder, like you knead water through dough for bread. In the same way, you get a sense of ease and then you knead it through the body. So you have to figure out where you're going to get the sense of ease, where you're going to get the rapture that's supposed to go along with it. And then how do you spread it through the body? That's the work of evaluation. Because once there is that sense of well-being, then that can be food for the mind. And until then, you're going to have to depend on your thoughts. Now the problem is, if the thoughts are not interesting enough for the mind, it's going to create more. In fact, it's been spending most of its time since it learned how to think in words, churning out thoughts, churning out words, sometimes randomly, sometimes with a purpose. But it's trying to provide itself with a steady supply of food so that when things outside are not interesting, you'll have something interesting to think about. You see this especially clearly as you're trying to settle down and you meditate. There's not much going on right now. There's just the subtle sound of the drizzle outside, the dripping off the roof. Not much to hold your attention. And as soon as the Dharma talk is over, there won't be much, much else to listen to. And so its first response is churning out thoughts. So you have to learn how to think about the breath in a way that makes it interesting, to fight off those other thoughts that would pull you away. I was talking with an osteopath yesterday who was talking about how, in their theory, there are many diaphragms in the body, in other words, parts of the body that are influential in the movement of the breath energy through the body. So it's not only the diaphragm under the lungs. There's an energy diaphragm in each foot, in each knee, down in the pelvis, right around the collarbone, and in the middle of the head. So you might want to think about that. How do these different parts of the body help the breath energy move? And which parts does it seem to be stuck? Especially if you have trouble with circulation down in your legs as you're sitting here cross-legged, you might want to start with a sense of breath energy moving through the feet. In other words, the feet are breathing, the knees are breathing. And if your legs tend to go numb, this is a good thing to think about. You've got a good reason to think about moving the energy down there. If you have a particular illness, you can think about how the breath energy, when you get familiar with it, can be helpful. I noticed with the general a lot of John Fung's lay students, after he died, many of them just kind of drifted away from meditation. But the ones who didn't drift away were the ones who had diseases that they found working with the breath was helpful for the disease. In other words, if you can give yourself a good reason to be here doing nothing but watching your breath, that kind of thinking can help the mind stay interested, because you're looking for ways in which the breath energy can improve your physical condition, give you a good place to settle down. When there finally is a sense of well-being, okay, then you've got something to work with. You think about how to spread it. If you squeeze it, then you've destroyed it. Some people try to squeeze it through the body like you'd squeeze toothpaste out of a tube. 
breath energy doesn't respond well to being squeezed. It prefers to be allowed. So when there's a sense of well-being, say, in the chest, think of it spreading out to the shoulders and down the arms, down to the fingers, and down through the torso, down the legs. Get it so that it can spread easily throughout the whole body. You have to think of opening, opening, opening the, the breath channels for this to happen. But that gives you something good to think about. Gives the mind some food. It doesn't go snacking on other things. There will be another part of the mind that's going to churn out thoughts for a while that are totally unrelated to the breath. But you have to do your best to make the breath interesting. You can't be on the receiving side saying, well, I want this to be made interesting for me. After all, it is your suffering that you're trying to overcome. You have to want to do this. This is one of the reasons why the Ajahns in Thailand didn't explain things that much to their students. They went there trying to please the students and hand things to them on a platter. Their assumption was that they were willing to teach you if you wanted to learn. And the way you show that you want to learn is that you make the meditation interesting. If you haven't found a way to make the breath interesting yet, well, work at it. After all, it is the breath energy in your body. It's going to have a big impact on your health, a big impact on your sense of well-being as you sit here. So it's up to you to find what you can think about that would make the breath intriguing, make it something really worth studying, really worth getting to know. And that way the mind gets fed. It doesn't go off to nibble on other things. And as you do begin to create a sense of well-being, a sense of fullness, Okay, then you can feed on that. But be careful how you feed. Don't go gobbling it down or wallowing in it. You still have to be with the breath. In the beginning, the distinction between breath and the comfort of that's caused by the breath will be hard to see. But always make sure that the perception of breath is there. It doesn't fade away and just think ease, well-being. It's your attention to the breath that keeps that well-being going. So be alert to the breath. Keep the breath in mind. And then learn how to play with that sense of well-being, how you can relate to it in a way that doesn't destroy it, and can go to different parts of the body. And ask yourself, which parts of the body tend to be starved of breath energy? Once again, neglected. Down in the toes, maybe between the fingers, different parts of the head. Look around. See what you can do to give a sense of extreme fullness to the breath. And as long as the fullness feels good, keep it up. When it begins to feel oppressive, you can think of ways of dissipating it. One is to focus in on the fact that right there where that sense of fullness is, there is a more subtle level of energy. And if you focus on that, it's as if the sense of fullness disappears, or the fullness feels oppressive, or like it's putting pressure on something. Remind yourself, it can't put pressure on something unless you have a perception of there being something solid for it to put pressure against. So try to destroy any sense, that any perception you have of the solidity of the body. Think of the breath of energy as being your sensation of the body, i.e. your awareness of the body right now is all breath. 
then that'll calm things down. So there's work to be done. There's thinking and evaluating. And that can be your food. If you make the thoughts interesting enough, make the evaluation perceptive enough, so that when the well-being comes, you know what to do with it. And even when it's there, you don't just feed off that. You figure out what's the best thing to do with this. How can you learn to modulate it so it's just right? There's a sense that the breath in the body begins to suffuse everything. And it can move quickly from one part of the body to another. That the felt need to breathe gets weaker and weaker. You've got what you need inside. The body feels nourished. When they say that the breath stops in, in the higher levels of concentration, it's not because you try to make it stop. It's simply because everything gets so well connected there's no felt need to breathe. So the body's well nourished. I have a student who has problems with the oxygen level in her blood. She has to wear a little monitor to let her know when the oxygen level gets low so that she can take some oxygen from a canister that she always keeps nearby. Well, she found as she was meditating, and I told her, well, try breathing with your whole body and see if you can get more energy, more oxygen into your blood. And she found that she could keep the oxygen level higher by simply thinking of whole body, whole body, whole body breathing. You might want to think of all those diaphragms breathing in, breathing out in unison. So the body is being nourished. And if you relate to the breath properly, the mind gets nourished as well. It's not going to go sneaking out for a little midnight snack. I guess it's got all the food it needs right now, and it's all health food. The ease, the well-being that come from concentration, as the Buddha said, have no drawbacks. There's nothing blameworthy about it. So learn how to think about the breath in a way that you can feed off of, that you can adjust the breath in the sense of the breath filling the body. So you can begin to put some of that thinking aside, and the mind really can settle down and find some peace. The peace that feels fully nourished. <laughs>